You may be seated. Amen. Thank you, music team. It's always a a busy but fun time of year uh, to celebrate the coming of the King. Amen. Glad you're here with us this morning. Merry Christmas to you all. If you're visiting uh, visiting today, uh, you are here for the beginning of a brand new sermon series titled, as uh, as, uh, Troy has already mentioned, The Word Became Flesh. Uh, This series is designed to walk us through the life and ministry of Jesus the long-awaited and anticipated King. We have spent the last 25 weeks hopping along some mountaintop Old Testament texts that foresee and prophesy the, the coming and the purpose of the coming of Jesus. We started in Genesis where we saw God create and crown Adam as king, giving him dominion over the entire earth. We observed Adam give up that kingly dominion to a serpent named Satan, that horrific event of disobedience to God resulted in the curse of sickness and death to spread to all the earth, where mankind was meant to enjoy dominion and eternal presence of God, sin stripped those realities away. God made a promise, though, some 6,000 years ago in response to Adam and Eve's disobedience. He began to unfold his plan to fix what sin and disobedience had broken. In Genesis chapter 3, verses 14 and 15, they record that promise saying this, The Lord God said to the serpent, Because you have done this, cursed are you more than all the cattle and more than every beast of the field. On your belly you will go, and dust you will eat all the days of your life, and I will put enmity between you and the woman, and between your seed and her seed. He, singular, shall bruise your head, and you shall bruise him on the heel. And so it is, we have spent the last six months skipping, like I like to say, or hopping along in the Old Testament, receiving detail upon detail as the anticipation of the coming king would rise in the hearts of all in Israel. While doing so, we learn from Genesis chapter 15 that this coming king would come through a man named Abram. Later in Genesis 49, we learn that that king who would rule the nations would come through one of Abraham's great-grandchildren by the name of Judah. In the book of Numbers, specifically in chapter 24, the scripture taught us that this king would not just be a natural man, but a divine king. And furthermore, the book of Deuteronomy in chapter 18, you'll remember Dr. Tim Sigler was here, taught us that we should expect that this king would be a prophet like Moses, doing many miracles. We learned in 2 Samuel 7 that this king would, unlike Adam, rule for eternity. Psalm 2 and Psalm 72 and 110 taught us that the king would not only rule over those who would follow him, but over all the unbelieving nations of the world. In light of all these prophetic truths, Psalm 22 gave us a picture of the king that stands in stark opposition to his ruling for eternity. That psalm, along with Isaiah 53 and other places, clearly teach that this eternal king would have to die. So it is, friends, that both truths we learned about the king must come to pass and pass in the person of Jesus who we celebrate this morning. He must come and die to reverse the curse of of Adam, the curse of death, and he must come and rule and reign in righteousness, and ultimately he must come for eternity. The prophets Jeremiah and Ezekiel taught us that there would be a new covenant not like the Mosaic Covenant, which would be established with Israel after they returned from exile. So it is, beloved, that the Old Testament paints a picture of an eternal king who will reverse the curse of death, establish a new covenant in his blood, and one day rule and reign in righteousness and justice for eternity. 
that has brought us to this point, to this day. Friends, it is the truths of the Old Testament which unfolded over a period of 4,000 years, detail upon detail, which create an unbelievable amount of anticipation for a divine king to arrive on planet Earth. Jesus' friend, the Apostle John, simplifies all these truths and thoughts of the Old Testament by simply proclaiming the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. All the words of the prophets, all the words of written Scripture, all the expression of what God had promised, the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. Before we get into the Gospel of Luke this morning, you can turn to to Matthew. We'll also be in Luke, as I just mentioned. I want us to stop and consider as we start this series that'll take us likely a couple years. I want us to consider Matthew's Gospel in this birth account. It's good for us as we get into the Gospels, as we transition from the Old Testament where we've been to understand and recognize that As we move through the life of Christ, the four gospel writers write at different times for different purposes and from a different perspective. I want to say that again. It's important for us to realize because so often the world comes to the gospels and they say, look at at how these things don't line up. The gospel writers are different people writing at different times for different purposes with a different perspective perspective. By and large, Matthew's gospel, the earliest of the fourth is, or four, is written by an eyewitness, an apostle of Jesus, Matthew. His gospel is mostly written to Jewish people who have a good understanding of the Old Testament, and it's good for us as Gentiles 2,000 years later to understand, just pause for a second and understand the, the, the early church is, is mostly Jewish. And even as Paul is going and being sent to the Gentiles, he is going into these cities across the the the, the dispersed Jewish world into what we now know as Turkey and these different areas, Rome. And he is going, where is he going? Straight to Jewish synagogues. And he is speaking in those synagogues. And he is preaching the gospel. And Jews are getting saved and then getting kicked out. And then they're reaching the nations. And Matthew, being written very early, is basically an apologetic to the Jewish nation, saying, believe the Messiah has come. It is written thematically, the book of Matthew, not chronologically, although it starts with this uh, birth narrative and it ends with the death and resurrection narrative In between it is really Matthew hopping in to different points in Jesus' ministry, all in an effort to prove, to say, Jesus is the fulfillment of the promises of the Old Testament. After Jesus' genealogy, Matthew begins in chapter 1, verse 18 through 23, writing this. Now the birth of Jesus Christ was as follows. When his mother Mary had been betrothed, to Joseph. Kind of a strange word to our ears. We tend to, in America, think of betrothed as engaged. And it is somewhat similar. It's saying, uh, here's a promise, and the future husband will take this ring that he has saved up for at least two months, men. You heard it here of your wages, all of them, not with the tithe taken out. Save up two months, believe me, right? And you give this ring and you, uh, you propose to be marriage. And we do that in America and, and we assume that, that, uh, that all things will go well, but not always. But in the Jewish world, it is not, not so. There's a betrothal phase, but it's a legal contract. A contract has been written. A, a literally, a price has been paid for the bride. And the bride goes away to... To, to, to her home, and the husband goes away back to his home, and he begins to build a, a, a place, a, a room on the house, and she begins to get prepared, and all this language we see throughout the text, and we'll study as we go. But it is a legal contract. Joseph and Mary are legally already bound. They, they just have not 
consummated the marriage. There is a difference. He was betrothed to Mary. Before they came together, she was found to be with child by the Holy Spirit. I don't have time to get onto all these things, but I want you to know just as as difficult that is that is in our own age. In that particular age, it would have just been scandalous to those families. Just absolutely scandalous. And Joseph, verse 19, her husband, being a righteous man and not wanting to disgrace her, planned to send her away secretly. But when he had considered this, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary as your wife, for the child who has been conceived in her is of the Holy Spirit. As we consider this and we hear this, we come to the Christmas time and it's a fun story and we always talk about the virgin birth and, and we understand those things and um, almost like a cute story, but we need to pause and understand, beloved <laughs> friends, that Jesus had to be conceived by the Holy Spirit. He could not be conceived by a man. The, the sin of Adam could not pass to Jesus. He was born sinless, unlike you and I who are born with sin, in Adam's sin. Nobody taught us to lie. Nobody taught us to scream. Nobody taught us to cheat. Nobody taught us to steal. We do all those things, especially if we have brothers and sisters before we're the age of five. And I promise you, your parents didn't sit down with you and teach you. Now, let me, say, let me tell, you, tell you, little Johnny, this is how you steal your brother's stuff. We are born in sin. Sin is present. And when we think about the Holy Spirit overshadowing Mary, the idea that we need to understand is, is this boy that is born is not born in sin. He is not born in sin. Keep that with you as we move on through the text here. Verse 21 in Matthew 1 says, She will bear a son, and you should call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. Now, if you're a Christian or if you've been around Christianity for any length of time, this sounds normal to you. But, beloved, when you look back into, when you peer into the Old Testament, you do not see a picture of the Messiah coming to pay for the sins of the world. You really don't. It's difficult to see his death. But this information, although old to our ears, is new to their ears. They would have been thinking the Messiah is going to come and he is going to rule and he is going to reign and all those things he will, amen. But the idea that he was going to pay for the sins of the world, what's being proclaimed here by angels. Matthew goes on to describe verse 22. Now all this took place to fulfill what was spoken by the Lord through the prophet. Remember what I said about Matthew's gospel. It is his purpose to prove that Jesus is that anticipated Messiah. If it is possible for you to understand that 4,000 years of history of looking forward to this one who is to come, of, of going through all the genealogies, of carefully understanding where the Messiah, 4,000 years of oppression, of exiles, is happening now. Matthew is writing, and he's saying, the thing is fulfilled, fulfilled by the, what was spoken through the prophet. He quotes a familiar Christmas verse out of Isaiah chapter 7, but we find it in our verse 23 in Matthew, chapter 1, behold, the virgin shall be with child and shall bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which translated means God with us. God with us. This would be no normal child. Matthew is pointing this out. He is going to be born of a woman, born of Mary, like Troy so eloquently taught us last week. He would come as a son of the law, yet he could not be a son of Adam. He could not be tied to that sin. The virgin shall be with child. And God would be with us. 
With Matthew's gospel account of the coming Messiah in mind, let us now turn to the familiar history of the coming of the long-anticipated King Jesus. The gospel writer Luke, after telling his readers that it was his purpose to put together an orderly account of the life of Christ, started chapter 1, if you'll remember, by recording the coming of John the baptizer. And you'll remember a few weeks back, Pastor Paul had preached this one out of Micah, who would come, this proclaimer, this forerunner, and Luke attempting to put together a chronological life of Christ, mentions that in chapter 1. In chapter 2, Luke begins, if you've made your way there, we'll be looking at verses 1 through 39, focusing mainly on 1 through 20. We'll start, now in those days. What days? The days directly following the birth of John the baptizer. We know that, that, that uh, um, Elizabeth, John's mother, is six months in front of Jesus coming. So, so we know then Mary is about three months pregnant in those days. A decree went out from Caesar Augustus that a census be taken of all the inhabited earth. This was the first census taken while Quirinius was governor of Syria. And everyone was on his way to register for the census, each to his own city. Joseph also went up from Galilee, from the city of Nazareth, to Judea, to the city of David, which is called Bethlehem. If you're familiar with a map of Israel, you'll know that Nazareth is north, um, quite a ways north of Bethlehem, which is about 20 miles south of Jerusalem. So Joseph and Mary make their way back to that home because he was of the house and the family of David in order to register along with Mary, who was engaged to him and was with child. It's good for us to understand that both Joseph and Mary would have family in that land, in that place, in Bethlehem. They would be going back to their heritage, to their hometown, so to say. Verse 6 says, while they were there, the days were completed for her to give birth. And she gave birth to her firstborn son. I want to pause for just a moment and maybe you can underline her firstborn son there. And this is just a theological note and uh, it's important, I think, for you to at least be aware of it. It's interesting here that Luke does not use the term only begotten son. We would find only begotten son of God throughout your Gospels. But here it says of Mary that Jesus is her firstborn son. Her firstborn son. This is one of many places in the New Testament that stands in direct opposition with Catholic teaching that Mary was perpetually a virgin. Like Luke chapter 2, verse 7, the text in Matthew, chapter 1, verse 24 and 25, sums up the birth narrative like this, saying that Joseph took Mary as his wife, but kept her a virgin, you might underline this word if you've hopped back there, until, until she gave birth to a son. The until she gave birth implies that Joseph and Mary, after Jesus' birth, went about a normal marriage, having other children. And in fact, we see those children recorded in the Gospels and the book of Acts. So it is, beloved, that the Bible teaches that Mary gave birth to her firstborn son, and she wrapped him in cloths and laid him in a manger. Now, we always see pictures of Mangers, and they're usually sticks with some straw sticking out and a, and a baby laying there. And maybe that's what it is. I, I don't know. Nathan just got back in the last 48 hours, I think, from, from Israel. And it's likely that as his time uh, went on over there that he was able to observe a manger. Did you get to see one? Yeah. And mangers are generally left over stones. Everything in Israel is built out of stone. And they're left over stones that didn't quite fit somewhere, and they came out of the quarry, and rather than waste them and have them sitting around with all the other rocks in Israel, one of Dr. Bookman's jokes about Israel is 
you know, when, the, when, when God was creating uh, the earth and the angels were flying over, dispersing the rocks all over, their bags broke and they all fell in Israel. If you've ever been there, right, it is full of stone. So what do you do with these extra stones? And they'd hollow out a spot in the middle of them, and that's what they would put water and food and feed in, especially um, at this time of the year. So they laid him in a water trough cut out for feeding animals. And why a manger? The text goes on to say, because there was no room for them in the inn. Might circle that word in right there in your text and write two references, maybe over in your margin. One is Luke 22.11, Luke 22.11, and the other is Mark 14.14. 14. Write those in your margin. You can go back and take a look at this later, but I'll tell you why now. The word kataluma is the Greek word behind the word in in our text. It is also the Greek word that is behind those texts that I just gave you. And the, ru, the, the word there is translated guest room. So, gee, there was no room for them in the inn, or you could translate in the guest room. The upper room. This is the place where Jesus would take his last supper in the Cataluma. The upper room, it was a room designated for special guests, for special times. It would be built in the upper part of the home. Now, it could be that doesn't really be, that there's not really a lot of history that records Motel 6s in Bethlehem. It could be that there was an inn, and there's certainly some, some, some who would argue for that. But let me conjecture here for just a moment and hope to, to build a little bit of the angst that is going on within this family about a birth that's coming before the, before the marriage. Are you tracking with me? They go home to their family. There's no room for you and that disgrace in our home. You can head out there to the cave with the animals and put your baby in a manger. It may also be that when they arrived, their family had already put up with or put up others due to the census, and there was no space in that guest room. Whatever it may be, in God's providence, Jesus, the only begotten Son of God, would be born and cradled in a space designed for livestock. Certainly a humble way for the creator of the universe to come to the earth, right? I want to spend some time now and just read through this text. I don't want to interrupt it as it is Christmas morning. And I like to let the Bible say what it says. Luke continues in verse 8, recording this. Luke 2, verse 8. In the same region, there were some shepherds staying out in the fields and keeping watch over their flock by night. And an angel of the Lord suddenly stood before them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terribly frightened. But the angel said to them, Do not be afraid, before behold, I bring you good news of great joy which will be for all people. For today, in the city of David, there has been born for you a Savior, who is Christ the Lord. This will be a sign for you. You will find a baby wrapped in claws and lying in a manger. What a sign, right? You don't find babies in animal stalls stuck in food troughs. You don't have to go around Bethlehem knocking on doors wondering where this is going on. This is pretty unique. And suddenly there appeared with the angel a multitude of heavenly hosts praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace among men with whom he is pleased. When the angels had gone away from them into heaven, the shepherds began saying to one another, Can you imagine this? You've spent your whole life out in these fields, enjoying the calm nights, looking at the stars, pondering the universe, and the brightness of the angels show up. It might shock you out of, out of some lethargy. 
And so they say, let us go straight to Bethlehem. <laughs> let us get there, right? Then and see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has made known to us. So they came in a hurry. The old King James there, I mentioned this last night, says they came in haste. They hurried up. These rough, uh, these rough shepherds, they didn't go, ah, I'll get around to that. <laughs> Maybe we'll sleep it off and get up in the morning, right? In a hurry, in haste, they run to Bethlehem and they begin to look for a baby in a cave wrapped in grave clothes in a manger. Verse 17, when they had seen this, they made known the statement which had been told them about this child. Can you imagine? Put yourself in Joseph and Mary's shoes. Certainly a traumatic event to having a baby. It always is. It's always, it's always dangerous. It still is today, even with modern medicine. And these rough men show up. They probably didn't hit the shower at the KOA before they got there. Probably smell kind of like the animals in the cave they're in. And they say, angels showed up to us. What statement did they make about this child? For today in the city of David, there has been born for you a Savior who is Christ the Lord. Verse 18, and all who heard it pondered at the things which were told them by the shepherds. But Mary treasured all these things, pondering them in her heart. Certainly Mary is pondering all that the shepherds came to say of her newborn child. The fact that they had both seen and heard from an, a host of angels and then in haste went to celebrate the birth of their creator must have been impossible to even begin to understand. You'll know that Sixty years after Jesus' death and resurrection, the Apostle John found it most appropriate to introduce his eyewitness account of Jesus' life with these words, in the beginning. This is how John, after 60 years of praying, meditating, walking, discipling, seeing people get saved and born again, he goes to record his gospel, and what does he say? In the beginning. These three words hearken back to the first words found in the Bible that we started with 25 weeks ago in the book of Genesis, chapter 1, verse 1, starts in the beginning. In the beginning, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And John's heart and mind, and, and certainly inspired by the Spirit of God, is, is drawing you back to that moment in the beginning. In John 1, Understanding the deity of Christ, as he has pondered and meditated upon these things now some 60 years, says this in verses 1 through 5 of his gospel, familiar words to us. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things came into being through him, and apart from him, nothing came into being that has come into being. In him was life. And the life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not comprehend it. And after a short description of John the baptizer, the Apostle John continues his description of Jesus this way in verses 14 and 15. And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. And we saw his glory, glory as of the only begotten from the Father, full of of grace and truth. John testified about him and cried out, saying, This was he of whom I said, He who comes after me has a higher rank than I. Now, here John the Baptist, inspired by the Spirit, recognizes that Jesus came six months after he did. He came after, and even in the ministry of, of Christ, John came first as the forerunner. He is First, but he who has come after me is before me. He ranks higher than me, and he existed before me. How interesting, right? 
even John the Baptist, whether it's just the inspiration of the Spirit here, but certainly recognize the deity of Christ, he existed before me. Beloved, there is no doubt that Mary, while pondering in her heart all the angels and the shepherds had said, that she was likely also pondering the reality that she had given birth to the long-anticipated, promised son to Adam, who was the son of Abraham, the son of Judah, the son of David, the only begotten son of God, through whom the universe, as John said, was created. And John the baptizer said, existed before me. What a thing to ponder. Have you pondered that this Christmas? <laughs> Have you paused in all the craziness of Christmas and the things that go on? Have you once again stopped to ponder God coming in the flesh? What a thing to ponder. In verse 21 through 39, Luke continues on with the birth narrative telling us that after eight days, the baby was named Jesus and that he was circumcised and he was carried to the temple in Jerusalem, just about 20 miles north there of Bethlehem, where he was born, to offer a pair of turtle doves according to the law of the Lord. Upon arriving at the temple, the new young family crossed paths with a man named Simeon. The Holy Spirit had told Simeon that he would not see death, kind of giving us the impression that he's an old man, until he had seen the Messiah, the promised king of the Old Testament. Think Simeon had a little anticipation in his heart. When Simeon saw the child, he took him in his arms and prayed in verse 29, saying, Now, Lord, you are releasing your bondservant to depart in peace according to your word. For my eyes have seen your salvation, which you have prepared in the presence of all the peoples. Listen here to this prophetic prayer, a light of revelation to the Gentiles and the glory of of your people, Israel. That verse 32 would certainly have been stranger, not completely absent in the Old Testament. We know that God set himself up in Jerusalem to be a place for the Gentiles and people to walk, and, uh, walk through and see God on display through his people. But here, going hearkening all the way back to Genesis, that Abraham and his faith in God would be also like the Gentiles of all the earth. And verse 33 says that Joseph and Mary were amazed at the things which were being said about Jesus. And Simeon blessed them and said to Mary, his mother, I think this is so interesting, behold, can you imagine? <laughs> Joseph is standing there with Mary, probably likely an arm around or at least very close. And Simeon turns very specifically and looks at Mary, speaks to her directly. Behold, this child is appointed for the fall and rise of many in Israel and for a sign to be opposed. And a sword will pierce even your own soul. You might circle your there. in the presence of her husband, and certainly others, that your is singular. He is speaking to Mary as we had expected it to be singular. But notice he doesn't look to both Joseph and Mary and say, both of y'all. Maybe it's some kind of prophetic understanding that Joseph is not going to be around when his son dies, the one he raises and teaches to be a carpenter. But it is Mary, her own soul. To the end of that, thoughts from many hearts may be revealed. And verse 38 says that at that very moment, Anna, a prophetess, came up and began giving thanks to God and continued to speak to him. That is, uh, speak of him, excuse me, the baby Jesus there, to all those who were looking for the redemption of Jerusalem. And when Joseph and Mary had performed... Everything according to the law of the Lord, they returned to Galilee, to their own city of Nazareth. Well, as we wrap up here, we might say, what is the application of this narrative? 
how do we think about? Why do we celebrate the birth? And yet, at the same time, we celebrate it through the lens of the reality of what Mary has just been told, that there would be a sword that pierces her soul. We celebrate the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ this Lord's Day. I pray that the reading of the text would cause you, like Mary, to ponder the words that Simeon spoke. The words that teach that Jesus would be the rise and fall of many, a sign to Israel and all humanity who would be opposed, revealing the sinful hearts of many. That's what happens with light and darkness, isn't it? As John writes of Jesus in the uh, very first verses of his gospel, that, that, that the light shone in the darkness, but the darkness did not comprehend it. Nothing has changed today. There's perhaps no more divisive words in our pluralistic everyone-gets-a-trophy culture than to hear the narrow words of Jesus himself when he said this in John 14, 6, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. Think of this. We all would maybe wish that everybody, I would hope this, we would all wish that everyone would spend eternity with God. But we know that that's not the case. The creator of the universe, the one who created you and I, put everything in motion, who holds the stars in his hands, says, I am the way. It's the narrow way. It's not a wide way. Not everybody gets in. The creator came with angels singing, with the world, with 2,000 years now of history coming back on this day to celebrate the coming of Jesus, not because there's a wide way, but because there is a narrow way. Beyond that way, just through salvation in Christ, the way to live life. For those who are truly saved and and truly convicted of their sin, it it is always a recognition that I've got to quit living in this way and begin to follow the way the way Jesus lived. I can't just say a prayer and think that everything is going to be all right. The invitation is to come and follow me. Put aside your sin. Repent from the way you're living. Look to the way Jesus lived and live in that way. I am the way. He is the truth. We live in a truthless world. Everything is relative. Everybody gets a trophy. Everybody wins. Nobody likes to be critiqued, telling them at some level that they have failed or not lived up. But yet Jesus says, I am the truth. And if the truth hurts, let it hurt. And he is the life. He is the eternal life. No one comes to the Father but through me. And as much as that seems harsh, Jesus gave this invitation to those who would hear in Matthew 11, verse 28 and 30. Come to me, all who are weary and heavy laden. You see, here's the assumption. We like this verse, and we love how it sounds, and I get how it sounds, and it does my heart good to read it. But if you are not weary from your sin, if you are not heavy laden, if you don't, if you don't, Understand the weight of sin on your soul and the punishment that is coming. You will will never come to the Lord because you have no reason to come to the Lord. So Jesus breaks through all that. Come to me if you're weary. Come to me if you're heavy laden. Come to me if your sin has taken you so far down that you know life must change. Come to me then. All you are heavy laden. And what is the promise? I will give you rest. Recognize your sin. Recognize that it's going to take you to the bottom. Recognize that not only will it ruin your life in the now, but in eternity, spent being punished by God in hell. Come to me. Recognize it. Let it be a heavy burden on you. But don't forget, if you come, He will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for 
For I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Friends, the reality is that Jesus came the first time to die and take upon himself our sins. In doing so, he bruised the head of Satan all the way back to that text that we read in Genesis chapter 3. And in his resurrection, he overcame that curse of death from Adam. Pause for just a moment and think about that. We come to celebrate the coming of our God in veiled in human flesh. On his birthday, and my old church always sings happy birthday to Jesus. I think it's a little weird, so we're not going to do that. <laughs> I don't know. If you want to do that, you can do it after I leave or something. But we come together on Jesus' birthday. By the way, can I just pause for a second? I have a minute or two. I had to do, you know, I do a lot of study that I don't preach on, <laughs> which I'm grateful for, praise the Lord. But I really spent some time and dug into this December 25th, and you know that it is a very early church history that records December 25th as the birth of Jesus. John Chrysostom is the earliest in church, in church history, living there in the second century, who writes of December 25th, and he writes it this way, the long tradition of the celebration of the day of Jesus' coming. We hear all kinds of weird stuff that the pagans, right, uh, that Christianity adopted the pagans and then brought all this in so they could try and trick them into Christianity, but but to be honest with you, it's the other way around in history. As Christianity begins to spread and begins to, to overtake the, the, the primary pagan religion of Rome, it's the pagans who celebrated in late November and early December all these winter solstices that, that then adopt December 25th, trying to save their false religion. It's interesting, isn't it, that we come today we celebrate the coming of the Lord on the day that the church has traditionally celebrated his death and resurrection. The story, as you know, is not over. Jesus will come again to rule and to reign in righteousness over the wicked nations. My question to you is, which side will you be on? Will you be like those shepherds who recognize the word of God, of course, coming from an angel, I am far from that. But I certainly read you those words today. Would you be like those shepherds who went in haste to behold the Savior? Or will you walk out once again, ready to come back to church in a year from now, and not make up your mind about the Savior? I just tell you that maybe church isn't your thing, and I I'm not begging you to come here. We certainly would love to have you a part of us, but I beg you that your soul be saved. You can do it right now. If you're convicted of your sin, you can call that sin and you can ask the Lord Jesus to save you. Repent and turn from your wicked way. Begin to read your Bible and ask yourself, how should I follow Christ? And God will save you. You can do it now. You can do it tonight. You can do it on your drive home. And you never have to walk back in this building. And I don't care if you do. I would much rather know that one day we would spend eternity talking about, Carl, remember that day that you preached on the Lord's Day and it was Christmas? I never came to church and I still struggled with sin, but I prayed that day. And I'll spend eternity with you in heaven. That is the gift and grace of God. Amen? Do that. Which side will you be on when he comes back? Beloved, as we finish out this Christmas day, let us ponder that the word, Jesus, God himself became flesh and dwelt among us. Merry Christmas to you. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for the power of your word and for the anticipation of now studying.